Anthony Ali, take it away. All right, I would love to. Welcome everybody to Virtual Shadowing Session 63. Today it's going to be the specialty spotlight with plastic and reconstructive surgery with the one and only Dr. Amr Nasser. And for upcoming sessions, you can go ahead and switch the slide, Dr. Nasser. There we go. Upcoming session. So next Tuesday is going to be Inventions in Medicine about intellectual property and entrepreneurship among clinicians. On the 17th is going to be Technology and Medicine about robotic surgery. And on the 24th, be Clinical Psychology and Research. You can join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Here is our virtual shadowing working group. So you guys get to know each other and who runs everything behind the wheels. And just to remind you guys, we have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle of our presentation, one at the end. If you have a question, make sure you guys put it on the Zoom chat and we are going to be taking them and we're going to be asking them once we get to those Q&A sessions. So feel free to ask any questions along the way. Uh, before we continue, uh, Dr. Fowler, a couple of remarks. Well, once again, I want to welcome you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is now 15 months or more into this program and we're glad that you keep coming back. And as long as you keep coming back, like we say every week, we're going to keep being here. We've got lectures planned out already for a couple of more months. And uh, this is the admission season starting uh, in a couple of weeks. And so we're looking forward to getting a lot of feedback from admissions committees around the country to see uh, what their perspective is on virtual shadowing hours. So welcome. So glad you're here. Welcome again, Dr. Nasser. So good to have you back this time to talk about your area of expertise. And so Ali, would you introduce our guest? All right. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the one and only Dr. Nasser, Dr. Amir Nasser. You've seen him a couple of weeks ago talking about general surgery and what it takes to be a general surgeon. But today he would he gladly decided to come back to talk more about the world of plastic surgery and reconstructive surgery. So without further ado, Dr. Nasser, you can take it away. Hi, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Uh, uh, very, very appreciative of being able to come back and talk to you guys a little bit about what I do now, which is plastic and reconstructive surgery. And you're right, Elaine, I see that in the chat group. Um, I could not get enough of you guys, so I'm back again. Um, let's talk a little bit today about plastic and reconstructive surgery. Uh, this is sort of uh, a world of its own, of very quite distinct from general surgery and other surgical specialties. And I'll hopefully give you a little bit of an insight today as to what this world entails. Um, I won't talk too much about who I am and my history and how I got here, just because I did that a couple of weeks ago. I believe that uh, lecture is probably on YouTube. If you guys are interested in my medical journey and have any questions on that, feel free to reach out always uh, or refer back to that. That presentation. But in you know, a quick summary, I was born in Palestine, went to medical school in Europe, went to New York for some research, ended up in Seattle for some general surgery, and now I'm at Harvard for a plastic and reconstructive surgery fellowship. And I talked a little bit about last time about you know what, what it takes to get here and sort of the extensive training and education that all of you will probably undergo one day if you go into medical school and then into residency. So just a lot of years to look forward to of, uh, of studying and training. Um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, when I, when I was in my general surgery training, uh, I had to go through the match again, which is reapplying for fellowships. And, you know, the most important step is after all that work, you've got to pray and hope you get, get what you want. And for some fellowships, it's through the SF match. And that's what I went through for plastic surgery and was very pleased to match in my number one program. Uh, and that leads me to uh, where I am today. So let's start talking about plastic surgery. I think that's a common question that comes up every time I meet someone like, oh, you know, plastic surgery must, must be really fun doing a lot of nip tuck stuff. And it's true. We do a lot of that, but plastic surgery is way beyond that. And if someone asks me what's plastic surgery, I just tell them yes, because it's truly everything. Uh, and it involves just almost every aspect of surgery that you can possibly imagine. This is a slide I put together here, and this is a super condensed version of what the field of plastic surgery entails and just how complex and uh, uh, integrated it is with other specialties. So as you can see, you know, we operate on every part of the body on every age range. And that's um, sort of very unique to plastic surgery. I would say there are very few other specialties that are able to do this. I don't think there are actually any other specialties that are able to operate on this many parts of the body um, on such a diverse age range of patients. Uh, if you take the head, for example, you know, in adults, we're doing 
uh, all the head and neck reconstruction, craniofacial trauma, Mohs reconstruction, obviously cosmetic surgery, which everyone's familiar with. In the pediatric population, we're doing a lot of the syndromic stuff, <clears throat> like craniosynostosis, distraction surgeries, cleft lip and palate, which gets a lot of publicity in the lay, in the lay press, as well as, uh, excuse the typing error here, it's supposed to be microtia for sort of small um, or absent ears. And then breast, obviously we do a lot of breast. Uh, that's what we call the bread and butter of plastic surgery. Um, but breast isn't just uh, uh, involving, you know, women with breast cancer and breast cancer reconstruction, even though that's what we do a lot of. We do a lot of breast reductions for a woman. We do augmentation. We do gender affirming surgery. We also do gynecomastia for men. Um, and a lot of the breast involved uh, that we do is also in the pediatric population, which um, sometimes is hard to believe, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's a very prevalent problem. Um, we also do a lot of thora uh, thoracic abdominal, um, or chest and abdominal work, um, hernia repairs, thoracic spine coverage. We do uh, giant congenital nephi for kids and a lot of plastic surgery, um, or about a fifth of plastic surgery involves the hand. Um, and that can be, you know, different problems depending on the age group as well. So in adults, we take, do a lot of trauma and pediatrics, we do a lot of congenital work. There's also a lot of gender affirming surgery uh, when talking about uh, the perineum and the groin, as well as lower extremity uh, surgery, such as nerve surgery, lower extremity salvage to try to help prevent amputations and some other congenital stuff that pediatric, the pediatric, pediatric population has. So as you can see from this one slide, and this is really just a, a, a summary. I mean, these, these really add on even more and more once you delve into it. Uh, further, but plastic surgery is very much a specialty where you have to master the anatomy around the body and you have to master sort of being comfortable operating in different zones of the body in different, um, on different diagnoses and in different age ranges. Uh, there are uh, still some main subspecialties to plastic surgery, and these are not um, exclusive at all. There are things coming up over and over um, uh, again, that you'll see over the years, but things that are very new in our field and very uh, novel um, that I won't go into too much detail in today, just because they're very super specialized. But in general, the main subspecialties of plastic surgery are craniofacial, microsurgery, hand, cosmetic surgery, and pediatric plastic surgery. There are a lot of other super uh, fellowships like I talked about, like migraine surgery, peripheral nerve surgery, et cetera, et cetera, that you can sort of delve into and specialize even further if you wanted to. And if you think about plastic surgery, it sort of makes sense. Uh, uh, plastic comes from the uh, word to form um, and essentially, or to mold rather. And it, it, it sort of started off as a specialty where we did a lot of the stuff that other surgeons were not comfortable doing. It was actually a plastic surgeon that did the first kidney transplant. Um, and that's because they were comfortable with the uh, anastomoses and the uh, uh, joining of two vessels. And it sort of developed from there and has become the field where it is today. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about some of these subspecialties. We can't unfortunately get into all of them, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of my favorite three, which are craniofacial, uh, cosmetic surgery, and microsurgery. And I'll give you just a little taste of what each one of these specialties involves. And we'll have some time in between to go over questions uh, as well as in the end. Uh, let's talk a little bit about craniofacial surgery. So this is often grouped with pediatrics to create a pediatric craniofacial training program. Um, like I said, craniofacial surgery involves both the adult population as well as the pediatric population. And the adults, we're really talking a lot about trauma. That's sort of the, the majority of what we see. Um, the majority of the trauma, you know, comes from other more vehicle crashes, gunshot wounds to the face, you know, your standard bar fights can lead it to craniofacial trauma or just simple falls. In the pediatric population, a lot of it is congenital stuff. These are kids who are born with congenital diseases that need to have their craniofacial skeleton fixed in some degree or another. And so this has sort of formed this special field in plastic surgery. Um, this is a fellowship that takes one year. A lot of it, a lot of times it involves a pediatric craniofacial fellowship, but you're sort of comfortable enough to do both adult and pediatrics at the end. Let's talk uh, about this case study. It's uh, regarding craniofacial trauma. So this 38 year old male involved in a motor vehicle crash comes in with polytrauma, multiple facial fractures. He's intubated, hard to get an exam because he's so swollen. 
and he stabilized in the ICU over the next several days. And obviously this comes without saying, uh, when you have a trauma patient, you're really, you're not gonna focus, you know, you don't call the plastic surgeon and say, hey, his face is messed up, can you come fix it right away? You really gotta take care of the patient as a whole and make sure that there's no other emergent issues uh, uh, with relation to their trauma. And sort of craniofacial takes a back burner for the first few days until the patient stabilizes and is either stable enough to go to the operating room or a lot of times we take care of these patients, you know, one or two weeks afterwards, believe it or not. But we get a CT scan on this guy and you see he's just got extensive fractures all over his face. So these are um, fractures over here, this fractures over here, and all these have specific terms um, uh, uh, that have been developed over the course of the past century regarding the, these fracture, what we call fracture patterns. Um, this is a 3D reconstruction CT scan. So, you know, you get a normal CT scan, they do some cool stuff, they reconstruct it into 3D format and you can sort of twist this skull around in all directions. It's not a great tool just to look at the 3D in terms of diagnoses. We just mainly looking at it as a whole. We still sort of want to look at the standard CT scan. But this is a great way to see the overlying trauma. And this patient here has a Lefort 1 fracture, which is a fracture pattern that goes straight through the maxilla all the way posteriorly into the pterygopalatine plates. And he's got a Lefort 2 on this side as well. Uh, so that, that involves um, the inferior orbital plate here and goes up into the nose. And you can't really quite tell here, but it also got an NOE, what we call it NOE fracture, which is a nasoorbital ethmoidal fracture, which is a very severe type of fracture and very hard to fix. So this guy needed all this fixed, obviously. Um, something cool, which I don't have of here, but uh, uh, if you have a chance to look at it on YouTube later, these fractures here uh, totally destabilize the midface, meaning that if you examine this patient in the emergency room or in the ICU, and you just sort of um, held their, their maxilla or their upper teeth, you could move their entire midface because it's completely dissociated from the rest of their face. Uh, that's sort of a, a classic, uh, classic exam of these four type fractures. So we take this patient to the operating room and we do what we call a coronal incision approach. So this incision here goes from one ear to the next, all the way on top of the scalp, and you completely peel off the, the, the top of the scalp. And uh, it's hard to see, but his eyes would be right here. His mouth would be down here. This is entire forehead exposed, entire scalp exposed, and you can really get pretty far here. And then we also did an intraoral approach. And the reason you gotta do this is because you can't sort of approach these fractures from just one uh, direction, otherwise you'll have scars and cuts all over the face. So over the course of the last century, really starting in the 60s through up to the 90s, um, uh, surgeons like Dr. Tessier from France and um, Dr. Gruss, who was out, in the, uh, out at the University of Washington in Seattle, and Dr. Mason um, at Johns Hopkins at Shock Trauma in Maryland, really developed these approaches and helped us understand how to approach the craniofacial skeleton in a safe and reliable way that you could do over and over again without leaving these patients with these extensive scars in their face. So this is again here, the intra intraoral approach to try to get to the maxilla and sometimes you can get to the zygomatic arch. This is here, the coronal approach. Um, and with those, you can put plates really all over the face. And this is what this patient ended up looking like. He actually ended up getting the forehead plate here too, which you can't see, but you can see he's got a plate here, a plate here, a plate here, a plate here, and just all these plates. Um, we also did uh, intraoral, uh, sorry, um, uh, an ocular approach, and we got a plate here sitting sort of on the floor of his orbit, holding his his uh, globe um, in place because he had a massive fracture here in his orbital floor, and so that sort of the standard um, big case in in a, crani a craniofacial trauma. Um, um, hey, Hammer, how did he do this? Was this a car wreck? I'm sorry, you may have said and I missed it. Yeah, I know it was. This was actually an NBC, um, uh, a car yeah, a car crash where, where he came in. And I, I believe he was, uh, you know, sort of the typical, you know, two in the morning, um, uh, drinking, unrestrained, uh, ejected from a vehicle, <laughs> very massive trauma uh, patient. So this also might have been an unrestrained victim, do you think, in the car? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I believe I believe he was unrestrained, uh, um, if I recall correctly. And you can just imagine just this, you know, his head just going straight through the windshield and then hitting the pavement and causing all this trauma. 
How do you get to so, the orbital floor if the patient's eyeballs are in the way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are about three or four approaches, and we're actually doing um, a study here on, on, on another approach. If I go back here, I don't think I can draw, but let me see if I can draw. Um, I think I can actually. Okay. I don't know if you, you guys, um, tell me if you can see this, but one approach is a very simple, straight, straightforward approach. We do this more for the older generation who already have wrinkles and you're not worried about scarring. It's called an infraorbital approach. And we just go straight here where you, where you imagine the, the, um, the infraorbital rim being, you can actually palpate your own infraorbital rim. Um, and you go straight on top of it, straight down to the bone and you can dissect right subperiosteally, get to the back of the, uh, the, the orbit, no problem. Um, this approach is not very, uh, um, uh, it's not very acceptable, I would say in the younger generation, just because it does leave a scar and there's no real wrinkles to hide it in. So instead of that, what, what we can do, oh, I'm sorry, I pressed undo one too many times. Yeah, I think what you, you can do is what, you can do a subtarsal approach or potentially um, a subcon subconjunctival approach. Let me see if I can get this draw thing to work again. Uh, unfortunately, it won't let me draw anymore. Oh, here we go, that's why. Okay, so a subtarsal actually goes right, the tarsus is sort of the strong layer of your eyelid. Uh, it's sort of what gives it its form. And you can do an incision right below the tarsal plate, which ends up being around here in this gentleman. Um, or you can do a subciliary incision, which the cilia are just your eyelashes. So if you do an incision just right, literally a millimeter below the eyelashes, that ends up being a pretty invisible incision. Um, all these incisions have complications. The most feared is what's called ectropion, when if you do it, it scars and it pulls the eyelash down just a little bit and you can see a little bit of the red of the eye. So we're also favoring uh, um, uh, not to do these uh, approaches. What, the most common approach that we do now is what's called a transconjunctival approach, where you literally approach it by making the incision on the inside of the eyelid. Um, and then what we do is we stair step, we come from inside to outside over here and stair step just a little bit to get extra exposure. And so the only thing that you can see is this external part here, everything else is on the inside and it's on the eyelid. And then you can go into the eyelid, down the sec, down to the, the infraorbital rim and expose the entire floor of the orbit that way. And so you're left with just this tiny little um, uh, incision externally as opposed to those larger ones before. And that's an approach that we're just, uh, we're just about to write up now and, and submit for paper. Is there much nerve damage to a terrible fracture like this? Yeah, um, I think the fracture pattern really determines, um, but yeah, you can certainly get a lot of nerve damage. If I go back to the CAT scan here, um, as you know, there are these two foramina right here. You can actually see it really nicely over here. There's this foramina here and its counterpart on this side. These are the inferior orbital foramina and these supply um, the uh, infraorbital nerves. These are nerves that are extensions of your trigeminal V2 nerve that sort of supply the entire uh, cheek and upper lip sensation, and sometimes even the side of the nose. Um, so injury to those nerves will just cause loss of, sen loss of sensation. A lot of times it's not total transection of the nerves. It's just what we call a neuropraxia or first stage nerve damage. And those will sort of heal over time. Other nerves that can be injured from these traumatic events. This patient, um, as you can see here, had a really bad uh, superorbital uh, fracture. And there's um, along the supraorbital orbital rim, there are two nerves over here, and I'll go back and draw them here. There's the supratrochlear nerve, which comes over here, and the supraorbital nerve, which comes over here, and that sort of branches off, supplies the side of your head, and all the way, your, your scalp, all the way to the back, all the way almost to the occiput. So transaction of those nerves might cause, might cause loss of sensation there. Um, you can even feel your supraorbital. Sometimes it's a, it's a notch and not really a foramen, and sometimes you can feel it. It's about two centimeters off the midline. Uh, if you just palpate your own uh, superorbital rim. And sort of this, this is what that, this, uh, what this gentleman got, got a lot of extensive plating. Again, this wasn't the final result. Um, uh, he got also some forehead plates too. Uh, he ended up doing well. 
Um, he did uh, have some pretty extensive damage. Speaking of nerves, actually, it's a pretty extensive damage to, uh, I believe it was abducens nerve. And so didn't have very much lateral gaze uh, um, anymore, had pretty bad lateral gaze palsy. Uh, but otherwise from a craniofacial standpoint ended up doing pretty well. Uh, let's, let's talk about sort of a more, instead of bony, let's talk about some soft tissue craniofacial work, which is, which I love a lot because it's very, um, very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about Mohs reconstruction. And Mohs reconstruction is sort of a term that's been coined about uh, how to reconstruct, sorry, the Mohs resection and Mohs reconstruction. So Mohs resection is a specific type of resections that dermatologists do um, for the uh, sensitive areas of the body. So <clears throat> mainly it's the face, but sometimes it's the hands, it's the feet, it's the genitals, where you really don't wanna take a ton of skin. So if you think back about how cancer care has developed, um, we have come with guidelines from the uh, National Cancer Care um, Network uh, in the US about what, what we call margins, how much margins you take. So if you have a melanoma, and depending on the depth of the melanoma and some other characteristics like ulceration or not, you have to take a specific type of margin. So either you're taking a one centimeter margin around it or a two centimeter margin around it to make sure that you're cleared of the cancer. Now with Mohs, they developed this for the sensitive areas of the face where you're just taking a little bit of skin around it and immediately sending it to the, to the dermatopathologist who can look into the microscope and tell you if there's any more cancer cells. And if there are, you take a little bit more and a little bit more. The point being that you're trying to save as much skin as possible over these sensitive areas. Um, the counter side is it's a lot of extra work. If you can imagine, sometimes these patients having four, five, six excisions every time that's more time in the operating room, more surgeon time, and more pathologist work just to, for, for one patient. But it ends up, uh, uh, and, uh, but it ends up being worthwhile. Um, and a lot of these patients, the defects end up being too big. The dermatologists are not able to close them. And so they send them to the plastic surgeon's office uh, for them for us to help uh, close these defects. Um, this is a six-year-old male with a pigmented lesion <clears throat> on his nasal tip. Biopsy showed malignant, uh, mal malignant melanoma. And now he's status post Mohs excision by a dermatologist. Um, and he comes to our clinic and the defect looks like this. Uh, the thing about these um, defects is that these defects are never the same. I mean, you can imagine if this melanoma wasn't here, but it was here, it would be a different type of defect. If it was here, it'd be a different type of defect. And so um, we actually did one a few hours ago, which it was on the nasal sidewall. So it was a defect right over here. That was pretty big. And so you got to come up with different, you got to come up with different ways to fix these. And there's a lot of literature about how to fix these. Um, these are the options that you have. You can always let things heal by secondary intention, meaning secondary, meaning you don't do anything for it. You just let it be and the body will figure out a way to heal it. That's not very, that's not very acceptable for most people, right? Because it's going to end up with a really bad scar. A lot of times it ends up with a contracture, meaning it'll pull things up or pull things down. And that doesn't, uh, you know, favor aesthetics at all. You can do a skin graft. Sometimes you can do a local tissue rearrangement, meaning you sort of free things up elevate some stuff and move things together, try to get borrowed tissue from one area to another. You can do local flaps, local flaps, meaning that you can sort of bar, uh, uh, do some geometric flaps, uh, 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 turning things in specific directions, uh, using uh, arcs of rotation uh, to try to cover defects. You can do pedicled flaps, meaning you are specifically targeting a, a, an artery. So it's either the angular artery, the facial artery, the supratrochlear arteries, supraorbital arteries, and developing a little flap or a skin paddle around that artery so it has enough blood supply and then rotating it to wherever it needs to go. Or you can do what's called a free flap. A free flap means it's completely free from the body, but it's a flap, so it's vascularized. So for example, you can take a, you know, a piece of skin from the arm, a tissue from the arm, from the leg, from the neck, um, with its blood supply, and then connect that blood supply somewhere else uh, to supply that tissue. We'll talk about, that's microsurgery. We'll talk about that later. That's pretty rare for Mohs reconstruction. We don't do that very often unless it's a very, very big defect. So let's, let me show you about what, what these sort of uh, different options look like, right? So this is secondary intention. 
this this is a, this is an older gentleman, and I would say this is probably the best secondary intention healing I've seen on the face. Some people might look at that and say that's not a big deal. I would say on a younger person, this would have turned out to be even worse because young people tell, tend to scar more, um, and they tend not to have as many wrinkles, and their their skin is just a little bit more um, homogeneous in color, and so that would have probably looked worse on a younger person. This is a full thickness skin graft. Again, you know, there's full thickness or there's split thickness. These tend to, if they're small, tend to heal pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, hard, hard for me to critique this healing because it's healed actually really nicely. These are sort of the local flaps we were talking about. These are geometric designs. So this is what's called a bilobed flap. You're, and hard to imagine, I know, but you're resecting this here, right? And then you're, you're making this incision here. Let me see if I can draw this for you. You're making this incision here and then this incision here. And the reason you're doing that is because there's no, there's no skin laxity here. So if you just did this incision and rotated this into here, you won't be able to close this because if they're, they're, this is pretty taut skin. But if you feel your cheek, there's a lot of skin laxity here. So you're doing the same thing twice. You're rotating this here and then you're rotating this here. So what you end up with this here closes as a single line, right? And that's the single line that you see right over here. And since you move this here, it closes sort of as a triangle or, or that round, and that's what you're seeing over here. And the A, the A flap, which is this one, you're rotating this in here, and that's obviously gonna close like that. And so that's how you end up, uh, just erasing it with this design and getting this closure. And it heals pretty nicely, you can see over here. It's not perfect. You have scars. Again, on a younger person, um, you know this 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 might not be acceptable. But for some people, this is very this is a very acceptable result. Um, and then there's uh, these what's, other. What's, what size is it? What size suture is that? Is a seven o six o. This is this is uh, usually a five o. Um, you could do four o's for the deeper stuff. Uh, five o's here for kids. You're right, we do 6070 for, for the pediatrics. So if this was a pediatric patient, we'd probably do 6070. Um, and this is a really cool flap here. So this is a dorsal mitre flap. Um, and it's, it's named that way because you can see this over here. It looks like the mitre of the Pope's cap, that thing the Pope wears. And what you're doing here, I oh, did this thing again, I'm sorry. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is, Sort of these triangles here are what's called Burroughs triangle. If you can imagine, they lifted this up all the way here and they brought this tip all the way to here and they brought this all the way to this edge. And then because there's a lot of laxity on the side of your nose and your cheek here, they can they managed to pull this cheek in and close it. But if you just did that, um, where would this tissue go? This tissue is all going to bunch up over here. And then where would this tissue go? This is going to bunch up. These are what we call Burroughs triangles. So you end up actually resecting these. And I don't think that they actually ended up resecting this one from what it looks like, but they definitely resected this one. And you end up resecting these Burroughs triangles so you can get everything closed. So it's, it was so hard for me to imagine that in order to get this defect closed, you had to even take more tissue out. Um, and this, I, this is what makes Mo's reconstruction so fascinating to me is that every time I see one, I'm still fascinated at how these things work and how amazing it is that we can get this result. So these are all these options. That's not what we did for this patient. What we ended up doing for this patient or what ended up happening for this patient was a paramedian forehead flap. And this is a really cool flap. Um, like I said, these um, local flaps or the pedicled flaps rather are, are flaps based off an, off an arterial supply. So you have an artery and in this case, they have the artery outlined here, and this is the supratrochlear artery. And if you elevate, like they did over here, the skin paddle off the supratrochlear artery and rotate it down, then you know that tip of the artery, the tip of the flap is going to have a blood supply. It's not going to die. And that's what you do here. You're elevating this sort of flap. This is a defect, rotating it down. And then a lot of times this here, the forehead, there's a lot of laxity in the forehead. You can close it primarily, primarily meaning just bring it together. Even if there's an open area, which actually there's always an open area up top because there's less movement up here because your galia is very attached to your skull. Um, the higher up you go in your scalp, this will close beautifully with 
secondary tension, going back to secondary tension, this closes very nicely. So what does that look like? This is what that looks like. Um, and this is sort of, it looks like, you know, it looks like he's got a big slug on his face. This is not permanent, obviously. Um, this is just until uh, this tissue down here can get blood supply from the, from the tissues around it. And this takes a while, but this is what's so beautiful about the body, it figures things out. And there are different ways. This is called neoangiogenesis. And it's, 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 a, it's the method of forming new blood vessels. So as soon as you attach this tissue here, it starts forming new little blood vessels that grow from the tissue around it. And so what happens, it becomes less dependent on the artery that is running through this pedicle flap. So if it becomes less dependent on the artery, can we get rid of this artery? And can, can we get rid of all this and just have this sitting down here where the defect was? The question is yes. How long does that take? Usually two to four weeks. If you're a young, super healthy individual in your early teens or 20s, probably two to three weeks. If you're older and your blood vessels are a little bit calcified, or if you're a smoker, it might take four to six weeks. Um, this here is just, I think, a little bit of special dressing they have on the bottom side. You can see they closed everything here primarily. So all this is nice and closed. What does that look like after a few months? Well, it looks like this. So what happened? How did this become this? They went back after a few weeks. They made a cut over here. Let me just erase all this junk for you guys. They made a cut over here. They threw all this tissue away because you don't need it, right? That's not where the defect was. If you go back to the defect, the defect is just over here. You don't need all the tissue sitting on the dorsum of his nose. Toss all this away. Sometimes you can rotate this back to here a little bit just to close this here primarily. Um, and then you hope that this tissue here has got an ingrowth of vessels enough to survive. Most of the time it does. And then after a while, it heals well, and it looks like this. This is a scar, almost imperceptible, and he's got a good reconstruction of his nose. Amar, I wish you could see uh, what's in chat. <laughs> You've got kids going crazy saying, holy cow, how in the world <laughs> did you do that? Yeah, this is, this is truly what, this is the beauty of plastic surgery is just taking, you know, taking a problem, and help, trying, to help, trying to help a patient, trying to fix the problem. And this, I would say, is a relatively routine flap. Um, if I could zoom in here a little bit, I would show you guys that actually, you know, this is cartilage here and then this is lining. So it gets a little bit more complex. You know, there's three layers to the nose. There's, there's the mucosal layer, the inside of your nose. Then there's the cartilage or the hard stuff of your nose. And then there's soft tissue. And you got to fix all of that. So sometimes we have to take cartilage from the ear or if, it's, if a lot of it's missing from the ribs. Um, sometimes you have to fix the lining by doing flaps on the inside of the nose to help fix the lining. So um, it becomes a little bit more complex as the wound and the defect gets larger and larger. But there's always a way. There's always a way to fix it. So it's it's interesting you didn't make him uh, shave his mustache off before the surgery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That would be that. I think that'd be too cruel. No. Um, so I think we have a little time here for some Q and A. Um, Happy to answer any questions. Um, Ellie, if you want to uh, point me to the ones that I can answer. Yeah, um, of course, of course. Um, before, I just got to say what Dr. Fowler said. The chat was going crazy just seeing the before and after picture for the Mose reconstruction. That's incredible to see. <laughs> um, so first question that we got. So what are the risks of infections post-surgery of something like a craniofacial surgery? that could, you know, spread to the brain and cause issues in the nervous system because the problems of infection after surgery is pretty common. Like that's always like a, an issue that's always raised up. Are there any risk for plastic surgeries or is it something different? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll break that question into two or three parts rather. Um, the first part is you're right. Yeah, the risk of infection is, is there with every single operation. I think it very uh, varies based off the operation, off the patient, off the location. So if you think about the operation, um, if you have a simple operation uh, that uh, you know, has very little involvement or is a clean, what we call a clean operation, the risk of um, infection is pretty low. It's usually between you know, one or 2%. Um, you have different categories of, of, of uh, the cleanliness, let's say of an operation. It goes from clean, clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty wounds. 
And that's a very known classification within the surgical subspecialties. Um, specific to plastic surgery, again, also depends on the type of surgery. Um, the risk of infection for like lower extremity operations where the lower extremity is a little bit dirtier, you can imagine, harder to keep clean. It also has less worse blood supply. The risk of infections are a little bit higher than infections of the face. Believe it or not, and this also to me is still mind boggling. And I catch myself, um, I catch myself sort of commenting on this every time I'm operating on the facial craniofacial skeleton. The face is so dirty. Think about it's 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 always exposed. You're always touching it. Think about what's in your mouth. Think about what's in your nose. So yeah. dirty. Yet we're going through the mouth and fixing bones. Not only that, we're also putting hardware there. We're putting foreign material in the cheeks through the bone. And yet somehow it does. It very very rarely gets infected. But then if you look at orthopedic surgery, and if any of you have the pleasure of subscribing to an orthopedic surgery case where they're doing joint replacements or even fractures on the, you know, uh, legs they take their sterility so seriously and they have all these special, you know, stuff to uh, prevent even flex of skin or hair from flying off them. They have, they're like, they gown up in these like masks and ventilated suits all for sterility because it's so important because once you get a contaminant, once you get a little bit of bacteria in there, contaminates the joint replacement, it's a nightmare. Those things get infected. So what's the difference? Why is hardware in the face going through a bunch of bacteria in the mouth, dragging all that saliva with it and sitting there and not getting infected. But a joint replacement gets reflected, gets infected and it's a disaster, even, even though it's so much more sterile. And I think it's all down to the vascularity. If you have good vascularity, like the face, it's such a vascular structure. Your body is able to fight off any even quiver of infection, suppress any bacterial growth, and completely eliminate it. Whereas if you look at a joint or an extremity where it's you know, you know, a single vascularity, it's distant from the heart, it gets less blood supply than the face. I think it's just that much more important to be extremely sterile and try to help prevent infections. And I think that's just a remarkable, you know, a remarkable example of what the body is capable of. But also it's remarkable just to think about how how we I think we sometimes treat every patient the same and, and I'm starting to realize that's, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not, it's, uh, the body's not built that way. Um, if you have a patient who smokes, has vascular disease, um, has diabetes, uh, has obesity, all these things are affecting your, are affecting your microvascular circulation. And so inherently that patient's going to have poorer or less blood flow to any part of the body. You have to be even more careful of those patients. You might even have to put them on extra antibiotics prophylactically just to help prevent infections. And that's just the importance of being so rigorous and, and so detail-oriented in the field of surgery. I completely get that. My father, he is a diabetic, and he had had an orthopedic surgery a couple of years ago. And he got infected with a cephalococcus infection. And it was something that we didn't really see coming that just led to more rehab and more surgery. So learning more about infections and what to do to prevent them and seeing like the different parts and of different patients is something that's very important. So I'm happy that you addressed about that. Um, another question that we have is something that's more about the sort of ideology of society on plastic surgery. You know how plastic surgery is always looked as some, uh, something that people of high class and that are usually very rich have. So one question that we gotten was, do you guys take care of all kinds of patients or only the patients that would pay since, you know, it's plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, that sort of thing? So, yeah, I mean, um, I think that's just a, uh, I think that's an era of society to have classified plastic and reconstructive surgery um, as sort of purely as cosmetic surgery. I think it's sort of what, you know, it's, it's what draws media attention and, you know, everyone wants to hear about celebrities and it, it just draws gossip, right? So it's easy to see how it got that complete like misnomer as a purely cosmetic su surgery field. But um, like I mentioned, I'll go back here um, to the slide. It's sort of plastic surgery really is all these specialties. It's craniofacial microsurgery and cosmetic pediatric and a few others. And so, you know, everything except cosmetic surgery, I mean, it's all insurance based, just like every other type of surgery. You know, if you have colon cancer 
or uh, or if you have a fi- or if you have facial trauma, it's all going to be covered by insurance. You know, fingers crossed, your insurance covers it. There's a little right. bit more nuance to that, but but in general, cosmetic surgery is not is not obviously insurance <laughs> is not insurance covered. And so yeah, so that that is sort of a little bit where it gets that, that it's you know it's um it's named from uh, for being sort of you know for the rich and uh, and um, and whatever. But but even then, I mean. It, if you look at cosmetic surgery, it's not really that out of, out of reach for the majority of the population. I, I think there are, just like anything else, there's tiers of, there's tiers of cosmetic surgery. There's also, and I won't talk, talk too much about that, but there's a lot of cosmetic surgery done by non-plastic surgeons. Um, and sort of, it's sort of being, uh, uh, those um, you know, surgeons or those physicians are misrepresenting themselves and calling themselves facial plastic surgeons or calling themselves cosmetic surgeons. And I think the lay population hasn't picked up on this yet. Um, c- cosmetic surgery is a non, non-ACGME accredited fellowship. Any, anyone who's done any type of surgery can do one year of cosmetic surgery and then call himself a cosmetic surgeon. So you could do, you know, you could do, you could be doing um, liver cancer for 30 years, go do a year of cosmetic surgery fellowship, which is a non it could be any type of fellowship. It's non-ACGME accredited, meaning, you know, if I'm a cosmetic surgeon, I can, I can open up a fellowship and just train someone. Um, and then those people can call, call themselves cosmetic surgeons. So I think it's very important to, um, to know what kind of cosmetic surgery you're getting. But while we're on the topic, that's what differentiates the pricing, right? If you're going to go to a plastic surgeon who trained, who is specializing in cosmetic surgery, it's going to be probably a little bit pricier for the most part than a cosmetic surgeon who, you know, is like sort of in a way misleading uh, um, the population into what, what they are and what they offer. Um, but I, that's sort of a pet peeve of mine. I won't get too much into that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Was- it, it is important for us to understand like differentiation and that sort of thing. So I'm happy you addressed that as well. Um, yeah. Earlier in the presentation, you talked about how there's two types of specialties for like adults or plastic surgeries and you know, pediatrics, so mainly children's base. So we were wondering how do surgery procedures differ for children and adults? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think when you, and I had the opportunity to do general surgery first. So I could, I got to see the world of general surgery, both involves pediatric surgery as well as adult surgery, obviously. Uh, so I got to see it all, both in general surgery and plastic surgery. I think the world of pediatric surgery in general is just a lot more sensitive, not just in terms of you're dealing with kids and you're dealing with their parents and all everyone in the hospitals a little bit more high strung because you're dealing with kids and that that stuff but also their tissues are a little bit more sensitive you have to be more careful um uh, and things are just obviously much smaller i mean if you're talking about doing going back to this slide over here and showing you the range of surgery if you're doing a cleft lip on a on a patient we usually do that at two or three months imagine the size of a two or three month you know year old right um and so you're trying to fix their lip and sometimes it's, it's a very complex closure and very complex. So you're doing things that are much smaller um, and that might have, and that will have lifelong, you know, repercussions to what you do. These, these patients have to, these kids, patients have to live with this operation for the rest of their lives. Um, when you do, when you're doing the craniofacial trauma, a lot of it is people in their twenties and thirties um, not that you, you don't care less necessarily. It's just, you have more wiggle room. Um, and if you're doing like, for example, Mohs reconstruction, you know, a lot of these patients are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, that's who gets that type of skin cancer. And so a lot of times you just have more wiggle room and things aren't as sensitive per se. Um, so that's sort of the main difference. Uh, the operations differ extensively, right? You don't necessarily get the same operation indications to operate on kids as you do in adults. And so, so the operation itself is almost completely different depending on what you're doing. That's also a major difference between the two. All right, all right. Um, so I'll ask two more questions and then we'll go back to the presentation. So the first one is regarding craniofacial surgery and how, you know, usually sometimes you might deal with the eyes, the nose, the nerves, other areas of the body. So one person was asking, do you guys often work in combination with other specialties and other specialists? when you guys are operating? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, and I'm sure the person who asked this probably has some experience because I'm, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great question to ask. We, we do, a, a lot of times, you know, it's funny, they, they call the plastic, they call, I think they call the pathologist 
the doctor's doctor. And then they call the plastic surgeon, the surgeon's surgeon. It's because we really, aside from cosmetic surgery, we don't have a field where patients just walk into your office. Like no one's going to walk into your office and say, hey, I broke my face. Can you help me fix it? Or, hey, I got this massive hole in my nose. Can you help me fix it? Right. People are, patients are referred to us from other surgeons. And so almost exclusively, we are dealing with other specialties. Now, is that inside the operating room where it's, you know, two teams combined, or is that just, you know, having referrals? It's sort of a combination of both. Um, a lot of what we do is referral based, uh, but a lot of what we do is also a combination with other, other teams. For example, um, a case I did yesterday, uh, uh, which was a, a, a mandibular reconstruction. I don't know if I'm showing you guys one of those later. I don't think so, but um, I might actually, I'm not sure. But essentially it, um, it was a 17 year old uh, who had his, uh, an osteosarcoma of his left mandible. Okay. And then the OMFS, which is the oral maxillofacial surgery team, and the uh, otolaryngology team resected um, part of his mandible, did a lymph node dissection of his neck. Um, and then in the operating room, they're like, okay, here you go, like, fix this, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a little bit more complex. You know, we actually knew about this before. Obviously, we had met the patient before. This is completely like, this is completely planned. So it's not like they call us and be like, hey, come help us here. Sometimes it does happen that way, but this is planned. But, but you know, we're not sure if, 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 if this margin came back positive on frozen section and they went all the way to here, or this came back positive and they went to here, or they took more skin or they took less skin, you got to sort of be able to work on the fly as a plastic surgeon. And so what we did is we harvested a piece of this fibula, a vascularized piece of this fibula with its pedicle and a, a skin paddle over that. We moved all that. We connected it to his artery and vein over here. Um, we connected the bone to that, uh, you know, both the, the symphysis bone to that piece of the fibula here and then the fibula to that, to the angle of the mandible here. And then um, OMFS play, placed some what we call osteointegrated um, uh, uh, devices to be able to put teeth in the future and we close everything up. So the 17 year old boy now is going to have essentially a, a mandible over again. Um, and that's just one example of how we work in conjunction with other services. Um, but sometimes it can be as, as, you know, as on the fly as, you know, uh, calling us from the operating room. We're like, hey, guys, we resected this massive defect. We thought we, we'd be able to get it closed, but we can't. We need your help. The patient's asleep on the table in the operating room. And you just got to, you know, go in there and figure out a plan um, and try to figure out a way to get it closed. Uh, so a lot of what we do is in conjunction with other surgical teams. And it's very important to be collegial and be able to work with other teams that way. All right. And that honestly is super incredible, the stuff that you guys are doing. Uh, final question before we will talk more about other parts of plastic surgery. Um, I wanted to be something very um, focused on craniofacial damage. So someone's asked in really severe craniofacial damage, that's maybe unrecognizable. The, for like facial, the face is like basically unrecognizable after the damage and the trauma. Is it protocol to offer psychological assistance because, you know, how important it is for people to see each other and just seeing maybe a new body or like how they look at each other is going to be very important. So is there any like psychiatry or that sort of thing that's involved in this as well? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, um, facial trauma and, and disfigurement is one of the leading causes of, of, uh, uh, of, of psychosocial stress among patients um, in, in, in the craniofacial world. And depending on the range of deformity, a lot of times we can fix it and get things almost back to normal. But if we can't, and the, uh, there are indications for even more extensive operations, the most extensive is, is face transplant. And actually that's what was an area of interest of mine. So I have, I have a book on, on face transplantation, oh, okay. but um, there is an entire chapter in here and I'll show you guys just to highlight how important that question is. Um, uh, there's an, an entire, chapter on, where is it? On the psychological and psychiatric evaluation um, for, for these patients, because the majority of the indication is, um, is gonna be psychosocial, right? If you think about how far we've come with, with medicine, if you took away someone's face, you took away his nose, you took away his mouth, you took away his tongue, they can't sort of breathe that well, they can't eat that well, can you help them survive? The answer is yes, right? You can put a G-tube in them. You can put a tracheostomy and that patient can survive. So is survival our goal? Sure, it is initially. But long-term, our goal is to try to get the person back into, 
into the population and sort of um, like some normal exactly try to re reestablish some degree of normalcy. And so the ethics of face transplantation and getting to that degree of, of you know, subspecialties is still questionable, but you're doing this massive operation purely to reestablish normalcy because these patients have such, such uh, psychological traumas um, as a result of their, of their disfigurement. Um, so it's a very important part of, of, of treating these patients and being able to recognize that. And I think we sometimes don't do the best job. We're rushed or we forget about it or, you know, surgeons a lot of times are just focused on the, 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 the anatomy and the physical stuff. And we sort of sometimes forget about the psychological trauma that these patients carry around with them sometimes for years and sometimes for life. And it's important to, to be able to shine a light on that and, and to assist those patients that way. Um, a lot of the major trauma uh, centers especially when it comes to the pediatric population, will we'll automatically have a social worker screen that patient or someone from psychiatry or psychology, rather medical psychology, screen that patient for, for, um, for, uh, for psychological trauma and, or PTSD or, or acute trauma disorder um, and try to figure out a way to help them. Sounds great. I, I actually did not know anything about the social worker. I didn't know that they were offered. So learning more about that is great. Um, I will, we're gonna have some more questions later, but we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna be saving that for the second Q&A, so just keep that in mind. Um, but as of right now, you can continue on with your presentation. All right, let's, um, let's move to the second part that we're gonna talk about is cosmetic surgery. Uh, just because I feel like that'll be a lot of interest to hear about, you know, what cosmetic surgery is like. Again, it's very famous or, you know, infamous, depending on what you think of it. Part of plastic surgery um, mainly involves the face and the breast. Uh, a lot of times now it's also involving the body um, uh, and depending on what kind of operations you're doing. A lot of it is private practice, although academic models are becoming more common. And what do I mean by that? So if you think about how an academic model runs, it's not profitable for a hospital to run an operating room and uh, you know, hire the surgeon, pay the surgeon fees, you know, hire anesthesiologist, recovery room, nursing, equipment, all that to, in order for someone to pay them, let's say $10,000 for a rhinoplasty, right? Because all that stuff is gonna cost probably $100,000. So hospitals have shied away from cosmetic surgery. But in private practice, that model makes sense because you're not paying for all that stuff. You own your own operating room, you hire a nurse and you're, you know, paying them a salary and it's just a smaller scale. So those numbers make more sense, which is why I think um, historically it's been very common in private practice, but less common in the academic model. I think, I think it's going to catch up. My prediction is the academic institutions are going to find a way to incorporate cosmetic surgery into their practice within the next 10 to 15 years. And I think the way they're going to do that is they're going to have um, uh, day surgery centers as outpatient surgeries away from the hospital where the cost of running the center is much low, where they can crank cases out really, really fast and not have to wait for all the, you know, the wheels to turn of the big hospital and be able to turn this into a prof profitable model for academic models. For, ac for academic institutions. But that in general is why people always ask, well, how come, you know, how come, uh, you know, uh, there aren't that many cosmetic surgeons in, in, in big hospitals? It's because of this. And occasionally within plastic surgery, it's sort of seen as the end stage of a surgeon's career. What do I mean by that? It's not like they're fading out, the fire is burning out and, you know, they get kicked out and they go away. It's sort of quite the opposite. It's they've done so much and they've seen so much that these surgeons are like, all right, I think I'm sort of like, not bored with the, all this awesome reconstructive surgery, but I, I think I've, I've, I've done enough 12 hour cases and I've done enough of these like complex stuff that I'm gonna go do something a little bit, you know, less, less, um, less medically complex. And a lot of them go into, go into cosmetic private practice later on in their, in their careers. Um, what are the main parts of cosmetic surgery? Well, the face, um, you can do a lot. You can do a lot on the face. You can do facelifts. You can do blepharoplasties, which are surgeries of the eyelids. You can do rhinoplasties. Um, you can do lip lifts. You can do augmentation of different parts of the facial skeleton. You can put implants in the cheeks, the jawline, the jaw itself, jawline, sorry, the angle or the chin. Um, you can do a lot of breast work, right? You can do breast augmentation. You can do breast lifts. Um, you can do a lot of body work, especially for patients who have um, uh, massive weight loss. 
Uh, so patients who have lost, a, a, you know, a, a massive amount of their uh, body weight, that skin doesn't go away once it's stretched. And those patients have um, a lot of psychosocial issues because of that and, and need help. And that's where plastic surgeons come in and we sort of try to help them in that perspective, doing body lifts, doing abdominal plasties, thigh lifts, brachioplasties for the arms. So that's sort of the field of cosmetic surgery in general. Um, I'll talk about one case study here. Let's talk about rhinoplasty. Um, let's take this patient, for example, very you know common, you'll get a, someone in their 20s or 30s, a 28 year old woman who's unsatisfied with the shape and form of her nose. Um, no, no prior facial surgery. So she comes in and she wants to talk about what, what, what she can done, what she can have done. And it's very important um, to first of all, figure out what their expectations are and what bothers them. Because what bothers the patient is not necessarily what you're gonna see wrong with them or what society might see wrong with them. And ultimately what's your goal? Uh, your goal should be to make the patient happy, right? These patients coming in and they don't like a certain part of their body and, or a certain part of their face. And if they want it changed, uh, your ultimate goal is to make the patient happy. And so it's very important to listen to what their needs are and what bothers them and try to address those needs and not just try to give them a cookie cutter nose or a cookie cutter, you know, um, breast lift or whatever it is. Uh, so assessing the nose might seem easy, but it's actually very complicated. There are uh, what's called the 1075 rule developed by Dr. Rorick down in Texas, uh, who was at UT Southwestern. Um, and he developed this way to, you know, try to at least get some objective data about how to assess the nose. And there's a way to look at the nose from the frontal view, and you're sort of looking at all these things, and you can look at it from the side view, you can look at it from the worm's eye view from the bottom. And all these things help you then categorize the nose in certain ways, right? So. Um, are you going to have a, a certain type of deviation? Um, is it going to be narrow or wide? You know, are you going to have this you know, classic inverted V or saddle shaped deformity? Are you going to have you know, certain ways we talk about ALR rims? Um, and there's all these ways to classify it because as soon as you classify a problem, then you can talk about how to standardize a treatment. So no longer are the days where you know, surgeons trying different things, you know, back in the 80s and 70s and, you know, things aren't looking that great. Now we've sort of evolved in cosmetic surgery into, into a, an era where you're sort of classifying a problem and you're then approaching it with an evidence-based uh, method that is almost not guaranteed, but more likely to solve that problem from a cosmetic standpoint. And so the different ways that you can approach the nose, different operations, you can have closed versus open. Um, and let me see if I talk about this more in more detail, but a closed approach is sort of, um, let's say you take the nose. So excuse my drawing, it's not that great today, but if you take the nose like this, um, and you want to approach the nose for rhinoplasty, um, and here's the, the lip, um, you can either approach it through the nares where there's no external in, in, uh, incision or you can do what's an open approach and go across the columella, which is this. This here's your columella. You can go across the columella and sort of fold that entire skin up and what we call an open approach. So those are the two approaches to, for, for a nose, for a rhinoplasty. And there's two basic general principles on how to approach a nose, either resecting cartilage if there's too much, or now we're talking more about preserving the cartilage, but sort of um, configuring in a different way where you're not getting rid of it. I'm sure you all can, you know, picture someone who's had a nose job from, you know, I don't know, uh, some famous, uh, you know, uh, MTV or, you know, Michael Jackson or someone where uh, back in the 90s, a lot of people that classically very, very small nose. And I'm, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, where it almost looks like it's overdone. That's because back in the day, we used to resect a lot of cartilage. And once you're, you're getting rid of things, and then things sort of scar down and contract a little bit, you're left with something a little bit too small occasionally. Now we're talking more about preserving, so getting a more natural appearance and more natural result. Instead of resecting the cartilage, we're just sort of placing in different ways. And then if, um, you know, if things are too wide on the outside, there's different ways to do osteotomies. Osteotomies are just breaking bones, and here you're breaking the nasal bone, and specifically um, uh, you're doing the, uh, the, the nasal process of the maxillary bone. You can either go from out here, make two little holes and break those bones to narrow the, the, um, the width of the nose, or you can go from the inside as well 
and have less visible uh, scars. So this here is a patient, you know, before and after. So you can assess this nose, right? You, you, you have to be able to look at the frontal view, the lateral view, the inferior view, and figure out what deformity she has, and then try to figure out which of, the, which of these deformities bother her and what she wants done. And then you address it, you do all that work, and, and then you get it done. And then people will say, well, what, what does an open rhinoplasty look like? Well, it looks sort of like this. Um, once you cut across the columella, you sort of peel that skin off the cartilage. And the nose has um, mainly, mainly three types of cartilage. There's multiple accessory cartilages, but these, let's pick a different color since there's a lot of red in this picture. Let's pick a uh, blue. These here are your upper lateral cartilages. And they sort of come all the way down from here. These here are your lower lateral cartilages. And then um, I'm sure you guys can have heard or can actually feel your septum, which is on the inside of your nose. That's sort of, this is, this is actually a septum right here. You can see it, but that's sort of vertical and goes all the way back. Those are the three types of cartilages, main types of cartilages we have. And by shaping these different types of cartilages, cutting some of it, you can see here a stitch, putting stitches together. You're trying to sort of reshape and try to form these cartilages in a way where you get the desired result. And sometimes um, we're even taking the septum because we don't really need it. And we're putting little cartilage grafts here, what we call tip grafts or shield grafts. You have infralobe grafts here. You have alar rim grafts here. You have, you have spreader grafts over here. There's different types of cartilage grafts you can put to try to reshape the nose and give it the desired result. And ultimately, ultimately that's how you end up with a result that the, either the, patients want, the, the patient wants or you think the, um, what would best fit the patient's face. Um, and that's sort of, sort of the general concept of rhinoplasty. It gets a little bit more complex than this. Um, I would say, Within cosmetic surgery, this is probably the most complex operation. There are entire symposiums and conferences specifically only for rhinoplasty. That's how um, extensive people get in this field and how much, how much there's to talk about. But in general, those are sort of your approaches and the things you can do to the nose to try to help form and shape the nose. So that's rhinoplasty. Let's talk maybe a little bit about um, breast augmentation, the next, you know, most probably famous type of uh, cosmetic surgery. Breast augmentation just means augmenting something, making it larger. Um, it's uh, mainly for women, uh, uh, but there are obviously transgender, uh, male to female, who want uh, breast augmentation. Um, this is a typical example, 24-year-old woman presents with micromastia. This is just the, the medical term for micro, small, mastia breast. And she's interested in getting increase in the size of her breast. Here it's important to sort of um, ask patients what they want again and uh, what, what, they are, uh, uh, what end result they're interested in. Um, so she has a cup size A bra, which a lot of these patients who are, have, want augmentation have, and she wants to be closer to a C. Now, if, if this patient came in and she says, I'm, you know, I wanna be a, a triple D or I wanna be a G, um, you know, sometimes these things are unrealistic because it's not like, you you don't wanna do it for the patient. Um, it's that um, if you have a size A, a bra, or yeah, your, your breast size is, is a cup size A, then your breast mound is relatively small, meaning the skin that's over that breast mound is only a certain amount. To try to reform the skin envelope over a triple D is impossible because you just don't have that much skin. And so we have to sort of set that expectation for these patients that, hey, look, you're not gonna get there, at least not in one stage. There are ways around it. You can initially you know, make her a C or a large B and have, come, have her come back after two or three years and, or one year rather, um, and then put in a larger implant because the skin will stretch. Or you can put something what's called a tissue expander. We use tissue expanders in, in reconstructive breast surgery a lot. And that's a pretty cool device. It sort of looks like a breast implant. I actually wanted to bring one, but I forgot. Um, it sort of looks like a breast implant and you put it in there, you close the skin, and then it has a little port, a little metal port um, on the inside uh, sitting on top of the, the, uh, the tissue expander. 
and you can access that port from the outside with a needle and you can fill it with saline or air. And every few weeks you'll come into the office and you'll fill it and it'll start expanding. And you keep expanding it until you reach the desired outcome. And that skin will expand with it. And after uh, four, eight, 12 weeks, you've expanded the soft tissue enough that you can fit whatever implant the patient desires. You know, she specifically has no prior pregnancies, otherwise healthy, no family history of breast cancer. These are important things to ask, obviously breast cancer, you know, putting implants in can, depending on where you place them, can make the diagnosis of breast cancer a little bit more challenging for the radiologist. Pregnancy is important, gives you an idea of the skin tissue laxity these patients have. And again, assessing the breast is, 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 is not as straightforward as, as uh, some people would think. There's actually a lot of systems that are involved in it. This is called the high five system. Um, and this is a great system to try to get a consistent and uh, um, appeasing result for breast uh, augmentation. So you're measuring the breast, breast width, you know, and then this gives you sort of a starting implant size here. This is what the breast width is over here. Then you move over to all these other steps. You're you know, measuring the stretch of the envelope and depending on how much stretch you can either add or subtract the amount of uh, CCs, which is sort of the size or the fill of the implant. Um, and then you're moving to you know, measuring the uh, nipple fold distance. And um, this gives you an idea of, of how much excess skin they have. And depending on that, you can add or subtract. And then you can sort of estimate the final volume. This isn't, you know, a hundred percent, you know, it's not like this is all you can put in. You can't put more, you can't put less. This is just a guide. And then the, um, and that's just the start of it, right? Because then depending on what they, what they, uh, uh, what their outcome from this high five rule is, for example, take the skin pinch here. Um, you, there's different approaches to how you can put breast implants in. So let's talk a little bit about the approaches. This is one approach. It's the periareolar approach. So there's retractors in the way here, but this is the areola and this is the nipple. And a periareolar approach is sort of when you um, just incise the bottom half of the areola, sort of like they've done here. And you can uh, enter the plane you want from that perspective and then put the implant in. This is an inframammary approach that so we're looking at the bottom of the breast here. This is the inframammary fold over here. This is the nipple, nipple areolar complex up here and you can sort of approach it this way and put the implant in that way. And a really cool way, which I find really interesting is sort of the uh, trans um, axillary approach. This is an approach where you go through the axilla, right? So this is, this is the arm that way. This is her neck up here. This is her breast down here. And you're sort of going through the axilla using an endoscope or a camera, dissecting behind the muscle and then putting it down there. And um, these are the approaches. There's also different pockets you can put the implant in. Pocket mean, meaning you're just, you're creating the pocket. It doesn't like, it's not like it exists. You're creating it. And it can either be under the breast tissue. So what we call subglandular beneath the gland, or it can be subpectoral beneath the muscle. And there's different reasons and rhyme or rhythms as to why we do each. And then it becomes even more complicated. There's different implants. Um, and I think actually there are two pictures in one here. So let me just see what it is. Yep, there we go. So there's uh, smooth or textured implants. That just denotes the capsule of the implant it can either be very smooth like the one on the left or textured, this micro texture like the one on the right. And those give different results and have different levels of complication. And to make it even more complex is different shapes. So there's these sort of what we call gummy bear implants. They're very high cohesive in, in um, uh, uh, high cohesivity in the gel and they sort of maintain that shape. And they're what we call anatomically shaped implants or there's general just round implants. And then there's different types of material, there's silicone and there's saline. So you can see how it complicated and get, you have the approaches, you have the pockets, you have the shape of the implant, the texture of the implant, the type of the material in the implant. And it can become um, a little bit overwhelming sometimes for patients. So it's very important to sort of coach them about what, what, what all these mean and what the different results. And so this is your typical result here. This is a typical, you know, probably an A cup, patient who ended up being probably a C cup to some degree. And um, uh, I believe this was a uh, inframammary approach. So you can see sort of the incisions just a little bit, it's sort of hard, but this is where the incisions end up, about a four centimeter incision down here and down here. And you can see they're very well hidden. The other ones we talked about are 
peri areolar here. And the last one we talked about is transaxillary, where the incision ends up over here. And so um, this is sort of the world of cosmetic surgery. A um, little, brief, little, uh, little introduction to the world of cosmetic surgery. Let's talk about um, you know, a, a very, very commonly um, used now and very fastly, rapidly expanding and, um, and much needed world uh, in plastic surgery, and that's the world of microsurgery. And so the world of microsurgery is expanding at a very rapid pace. And um, it sort of uh, involves moving tissue from one part of the body to another. Like I sort of talked, briefly touched upon earlier, um, in order to try to fix a problem, if you have a massive defect somewhere, or if you need bone for the jaw or for, or for the maxilla, or if you need a lot of skin and soft tissue for the scalp, or if you need to, you know, uh, adipose tissue to reconstruct the breast, it's, it, it's sometimes impossible to do these cute little flaps like the ones I showed for the nose. So what you need is you need to take a lot of tissue or a specific, specific type of tissue from one part of the body and move it to another. But then how do you get the tissue to survive? Well, you connect them to get, you connect the arteries and you connect the veins and that's called an anastomosis. And you're doing a vessel anastomosis, arteries and veins, and you're doing it under microsurgical technique. A lot of times we're doing these um, under the microscope. And these are, this is a very, very technical, probably the most technical field that exists in surgery in general, in all types of surgery, because what you're dealing with here is true microsurgery. Um, the thread, I'll give you an example, when you're closing sort of, um, you know, the abdomen on the outside, you're using a, a, a 2 or maybe a 1-0 thread. Um, that's just sort of the size of the, of the thread. Um, in microsurgery, it goes down to an 11 O. I know it's a bigger number, 11 is bigger than two, but it's actually much, 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 much smaller to the point where you could be holding it and it's almost impossible to see. Um, and then the vessels that we're connecting, um, depending on the type of microsurgery, if it's microsurgery, it's between one or two millimeters. So the two vessels are just about this, this much in diameter. You got to put about eight stitches in there. Um, or if it's super microsurgery, then it's sub millimeter. So you're connecting two vessels that are sub millimeter together. So this is very technically, very technically challenging, very hard to learn. Um, and so let's talk about the breadth of microsurgery. Uh, microsurgery is, it's a field, but it's really actually a technique, right? Um, because you're operating all over the body. And so this here is, this patient ended up with a massive defect over his, over his skull. There's nothing you could do about it unless you get tissue from somewhere else. Um, the one thing I'll point about a microsurgery is it's the results aren't as cosmetically appealing um, a lot of times as other types of surgery because the problem is just infinitely larger. Here, no, here you're almost no longer just talking about restoring the patient back to their normal self. You're trying to get them as close as possible, but a lot of times you're trying to fix a massive problem. And this patient here had a squamous cell carcinoma, got resected, ended up with this massive defect here in their jaw and soft tissue. And this is just like the operation I described to you, which I did yesterday, uh, a free fibula flap. This is a fibula. This is the artery and, and vein over here. This is a plate. This is this, what we call the skin paddle. And you're putting all that here situated in place. And this is the end result. This is sort of the end result after a few weeks. A lot of times these patients are coming back for what we call secondary third fourth revisions where we're trying to make this a little bit more cosmetically and functionally appealing. We're getting rid of some of the fat, trying to contour it. And a lot of times the results are actually incredible one or two years down the line, but it does take many operations to do this. Um, probably the most common type of microsurgery we do is for breast reconstruction. So this is a woman that had um, a, a, a total mastectomy. And how do you try to restore some function for this woman? Well, you're missing two things here, right? Like we talked about in the breast augmentation, you can't really put a massive implant to try to bring tissue here because there's, there's just no skin. I mean, there's skin, but it's just, it's flat skin. You can't expect that skin to, 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 to become this size immediately. So there's two options. One, you bring tissue with skin, or two, you can put an expander under here um, and sort of expand it like we talked about. And then once it's expanded, you can either put an implant in um, 
or you can put, or you can do microsurgical reconstruction and bring tissue. This patient had what we call a deep flap, D-I-E-P, stands for deep inferior epigastric artery perforator flap. And it's sort of an artery that comes up from the groin here and gives off a bunch of little vessels that supply the fat and skin of the abdominal wall, supply this entire region. And then anastomosis with the internal mammary artery, which then becomes the supraepigastric artery. So there's an anastomosis here. And what, you, what we do, let me erase all this stuff here. What we do is we create an outline sort of like this. And we take all this tissue, but we take it with these little perforators, meaning these little vessels that connect up through the fascia and up through the skin down to the deep inferior epigastric artery. That's where the name comes from. And that's the perforators of that. And then we take the vessel all the way to here. And so, and then we cut this in half, right? A lot of times these women are having a bilateral mastectomy. So we use one half for this breast, one half for this breast. We actually take the left to the right and the right to the left. And I'll, and I'll show you why in a second. But what you're left with is you're left with something that looks like this, right? So this point is over here and you got the vessels here. Now, if you rotate this 90 degrees clockwise, what does it look like? Well, it then looks like this. Looks like a slice of pizza. And now these vessels are no longer here, but they're over here. And so where can you connect these vessels if they're over here? You just bring this, which was, this is the right side, right? But then you bring it to the left side and you put it over here and you connect it to the internal mammary arteries. And you get rid of all the skin over here, but you keep the fat, but you get rid of the skin and you tuck it under the skin pocket. If there's no skin, like in this case here, then you, this is the scar that you end up with. This is skin from the abdomen. You could see her scar down here because once you get rid of this tissue, you just close it, bring it down here and you end up with a scar here. You have to recreate the belly button, obviously. And then this flap ends up coming up here and you create a, um, a new breast. And this nipple, an aerial or complex, as you can see, let me get rid of all this, these markings again. These, this is not the same as this. That's because this is reconstructed. So then after like, you know, three, three to four months, you come back and you reconstruct the, the NAC, the nipple aerial or complex. There's different ways to do that. Uh, common ways to create a cute little, uh, um, local flap and make the nipple so it's projected and then you just tattoo the areola if you don't want to do that and i think what this patient actually ended up having it's hard to see here but this is a 3d tattoo so actually this is totally flat skin but the tattoo artists have gotten so good and they're tattoo artists that specifically specialize in nipple areola reconstruction tattooing that they will tat 3d tattoo in a nipple areola complex that looks so real so yes, this patient has a scar over here and has a scar over here and a scar there and a scar down here. But if you think about what we started with and you think about the history of this 20, 30 years ago when, when this was not an option, this patient would have nothing or maybe a very poorly placed implant because there's no skin. And now these patients are getting this amazing operation that's able to sort of restore their feminine hood and give them um, way more self-confidence. What sort, of can, what sort of sensation will the woman have after that sort of surgery? That's a great question. Um, there are now advances within the uh, deep flap and advances in other types of flap to reconstruct the breast where we're also uh, what we call neurotization. We're trying to neurotize the flap. So we're taking some of these nerves that are in this flap. It's hard to, hard to find them, but sometimes we're able to find them. And we're anastomosing these nerves to the fourth intercostal nerve that mainly supplies a lot of the breast tissue if we can find a branch of it that's left behind. And sometimes a lot of these patients will get some of the sensation back. It won't be back to normal, but we're able to resource some sensation um, if we're able to neurotize it. Um, and also depends on if they have radiation or not. Uh, obviously this is cancer, so a lot of these patients are getting radiation. And that further impedes sensation, unfortunately. So it's not perfect, but we're working our way there. Um, a lot of you um, probably noted that this breast looks different than this breast. 
That's because I believe in 1996, or I can't quite recall the year, but there was a law passed where um, you have to offer women all reconstructive options, not just for this breast that is involved in the cancer, but the contralateral breast too. And this is a mild case. I mean, if this woman did not get a breast reduction on the left side and ended up with this breast on the right and this breast on the left, they look very similar. But you can imagine if this woman had a total mastectomy here and she was a grade three ptosis, so her breast looked more like this, which is very common after a few pregnancies. And then you gave her this breast, she's not gonna be, I mean, what's, I mean, sure you gave her breast, but look at the difference. And so thankfully, thankfully the Senate passed a rule, a law that mandated insurance companies to cover the reconstruction of the contralateral breast too. So thankfully we're able to do what's called a symmetrizing procedure or trying to give some degree of symmetry to these women. And this is where you end up with a breast reduction. This is the incision of a breast reduction. I'm not gonna go into too much, um, but it's a type of operation to try to decrease the breast in size, a lot of times for symptom alleviation, or in this case, to try to symmetrize it to the other side. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, breast reconstruction, which is very common. We do probably about two or three of these operations a week. They last between you know six to 12 hours per operation, depending on if you're doing one side, two sides, how complex it is. Um, but we do other types of uh, uh, free flaps. And this is another type of free flap, very common. This patient comes in after a trauma, has, um, you know, or this is probably after cancer, has complete, you know, defect here. This is after a resection. How do you fix that? Well, 30 years ago, this patient would have gotten an amputation and they would have a baloney amputation. They'd never be able to, you know, have a foot again. They'd maybe be able to walk. 60% of them are able to walk again. Um, but now we're able to do free flap. So this is an ALT free flap, an anterior lateral thigh. You take this tissue from the thigh. You take this blood supply with it too. You hook up the blood supply to the perineal artery over here. You put them in an X fix or external fixator for a few weeks, and then they're left with this. Well, some of you might say, "What the heck is this hamburger on the side of his foot? How's he going to put this? Foot? I was going to put a sock or shoe on." Well, this is just temporary, right? Like I said, these patients will need two or three operations, and so it's important to also relay that type of um, message to the patient and have that type of commitment from the patient because you don't want to, you don't want to do this massive operation worse to the patient, a lot of operative time. And then the patient's like, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to walk again because I can't put a shoe on and I don't want any more operations. You have to be straightforward and honest with them. Tell them you're going to need two or three operations. Come back after a few months, take deep bulk this, take some of the fat out. You can't do it all at once because then you risk killing it all. Come back after a few months after that. And a lot of times you're left with a very good contour over here. Patient's able to put a sock on, able to put a shoe on, and more importantly, you've saved his foot and they're able to walk. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the more details about how it's done. So first of all, you gotta figure out the defect. This is a soft tissue defect here. There's exposed bone, there's exposed tendons over here. There's an exposed artery. And so you gotta try to figure out a way to save this. Um, but first you gotta figure out the defect. This is the ALT, fly we uh, ALT flap we talked about. So classical flap, it's based off the descending branch of the uh, lateral femoral circumflex artery. And this is just skin markings. Um, and you can see this is the, the X here, X marks the spot. This is the perforator, uh, meaning it's sort of that little artery that comes off, the little artery that comes off the main artery that supplies this entire skin palette. And you can take that skin and soft tissue. Now, after you pick the donor site, sorry, you're now elevating the flap. And sort of this is what it looks like in C2 before we've taken off the pedicle. This is your uh, uh, vastus lateralis. This is your vastus medialis. Um, and you've sort of elevated some of the fat here and some of the skin. And this is the artery and, and, and vein. Very delicate operations. You can imagine if you injure this, you're sort of hosed. You either close up or you go home or you go to a different site. And sometimes we've got to tell the patients that, hey, if we can't, if, you know, something happens, we got to maybe go to a different site. Not ideal because then you're left with, you know, more skin sc scars and incisions, but sometimes it happens. And then this is the microvascular anastomosis. This is under microscope. This is sort of um, the needle that we're talking about, very small. And this is the suture you're dealing with. And you can see how you're trying to connect this once to cheer, once to cheer. There's the back wall, and then there's the front wall over here. And hopefully, once you release this clamp over here, the blood will go in and supply this flap. 
do you uh, do you heparinize those vessels uh, before you move them or after you cut them or something? That's a great question. We uh, we exclusively use um, heparin saline irrigation during these cases. So we don't necessarily heparinize the patient like you do in vascular surgery, but you're heparinizing the flap. As soon as you elevate it and you, you, uh, you transect the, the, the pedicle, we take it to the back table and we irrigate all the blood out with heparin saline, which I think is a little bit lower than the stuff we use like for, you know, clots and stuff. It's a one-to-one. -one, so one unit of heparin per one cc of saline. Um, and then during the case, you know, stuff uh, uh, um, um, accumulates. And so we're always flushing this while we're operating with um, a heparin saline, uh, sort of squirting it in there and rinsing everything out so that you don't get microthrombi and clots down into the flap. What kind of uh, sutures? Those things look really tiny. Yeah, this is so generally for side to side. So, um, sorry, for end to end. So, let's say it was actually the anastomosis was here between here and here. Then, depends on the size of the of the of the of the artery. But if it's you know anywhere between one point five and two millimeters, and we're using eight or eight o or nine o, once you get into the world of super microsurgery, which is a this is a perforator perforator anastomosis. Um, this is probably a one millimeter anastomosis from here to here. Sometimes if they're less than a millimeter, then you're, then you're getting to the, you know, the realm of 10 or 11 suture, which is just like, it's so hard to work with. It takes years and years to master. I mean, you know, I would, if, if I try to do it a lot of times I'm, I'm breaking the suture because it's so small. As soon as you tie it down, if even you have an ounce of too much, you put just, just a little bit too much, the suture breaks and you got to start all over again. And these are very, very sensitive vessels. I mean, the thickness of these walls are cells, not, um, not, not, not actual millimeters, the thickness of the wall of the, of the perforator. So we talk about the size, it's, 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 it's the diameter. So the diameter is a millimeter or the diameter is some millimeter. So um, very small vessels, very hard, uh, very hard cases, which is why I think in my opinion, Microsurgeons who are special, you know, plastic surgeons who are specialized in microsurgery, in my opinion, are like the most technical. I have so much respect for them. Um, they're they're just amazing surgeons. And then uh, the last last part, you know, after you've elevated, after you've done the microscopic anastomosis, you're insetting the flap, meaning you're suturing all the soft tissue. And this is what it ends up looking like. This is after a couple of revisions here, but you know, first you're you're first you're left with that hamburger because because uh, you got all that extra fat. But after a while, you come back and you slowly debulk that fat and defat it and it ends up being um, sort of something like that. Those uh, Tenno, uh, I guess, probably ethylon, nylon sutures, they, they're not removed, obviously, from the vessel, right? Yeah, no, the, 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 these are permanent sutures and they, they just live in the body. Uh, I think, it's, I think they, they did some studies on rats many, many, many years ago, where they showed that even like nylon and silk will absorb over time. I don't really know how that works because nylon's a plastic. I wonder if it's just like the body's like making like collagenases and MMPs like metallo, I forgot what they're called, metalloproteinases or something that end up breaking down some of these permanent sutures over time. But yeah, these are so small and um, yeah, there's no real way of retrieving that. No, nor does it really matter because uh, we use permanent suture that's way larger than this, two or three out. When, uh, uh, when we do like intestinal anastomoses in general surgery, um, using silk, for example, two or three O, sometimes four O silk that stays in the body forever. And that's totally fine. Um, and I think, I think that's all I have for you guys today. Um, open for some more questions. Yeah, totally. Uh, we got a couple more for you. Um, so first question, this kind of was a back with the craniofacial, but I think like once we learn more about cosmetic and microsurgery, this also um, is involved with this as well. Seeing how well the, some patients recover after such traumatic injuries, the way that, you know, skins and angiogenesis, the vessels, how they can reform and that sort of thing. Yeah, make sure everyone, yes, I think someone was. I, I, I ended up missing the question. Yeah, 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 I would get that. Just remember everyone, make sure you guys are muted. Um, so the question was re mainly regarding the face. Um, so what allows the face to regenerate tissue much cleaner with less scarring than mainly other parts of the body, like the foot and, you know, the hamburger and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I, I think it is going back to what we talked about. It's just the vascularity of the face. Um, it's just such a vascular structure. There's so many arteries, so many vessels. It gets 
a large percentage of the cardiac output that um, it's able to just regenerate uh, that level higher than the rest of the body. Um, also, if you think about the leg, the leg is, and I'm sure you've all got little cuts on your feet or your leg, you know, hiking or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, it's been two weeks and this tiny little thing hasn't healed yet. Like, or it's like, it heals so slow. And then the scar matures so slow. And it's, it's because we're always standing up and, you know, blood pools down there. And the more pooling you get, the more congestion you get in your legs, the worse the, the inflow is. And because um, the outflow is a little bit impeded because you're standing and you're congested. And so I think that all ultimately plays a role um, on a, you know, on a microvascular, on a tissue healing perspective. I think that all plays a role in it. Right, right. Totally. Um, I just saw this question pop up on chat. It's been asked a good amount of times, mainly what is the work-life balance of a plastic surgeon, especially now thinking about it when you used to do like a general surgery, doing the studying that now you're practicing that now you're a plastic surgery fellow. How is that work-life balance different between general surgery and more plastic and reconstructive surgery focused? Um, I would say it ultimately falls on the, uh, on the subspecialty you're in within plastic surgery, if you're in cosmetic surgery and you have your own private practice, you're sort of always on the clock because they're your patients and they're not, they're not gonna go to hospital, but they're, they're not that many emergencies. If you're on hand surgery, there can be quite a few emergencies. Um, anyone who has, and I, I didn't talk so much about hand surgery, obviously today we don't have enough time, but um, anyone who's got like a, a hand amputation or a finger amputation or a partial amputation, those are, those are surgical emergencies for the hand. You have to be able to get in there within an hour or two and fix the problem, either, you know, put the vessels back together or try to revascularize the finger or whatever it is. Um, and so that can be quite, um, quite challenging for the work-life balance because those can come in any time of the day. Right. Um, when you're dealing with other stuff, you know, breast reconstruction, there are very few emergencies. So the work-life balance is a little bit more favorable, but you're also talking about doing microsurgery where if, you know, you uh, put a flap somewhere and the flap doesn't, something's not right with it in the operating room, either you're getting a little clot in the artery or the veins congested. Sometimes you are there for 12, 14, 16, 18 hours trying to solve the problem because you can't leave that operating room until you solve the problem. So these can be very, very extensive cases, very challenging cases. I would say um, if you're comparing to general surgery, definitely hands down less emergencies, um, less critical life things. I would say it's almost nothing in plastic surgery that's life or death uh, for the most part. Um, but, um, but sort of it makes up with it it makes up for it in, in other ways, either you're in the operating room for longer um, or something comes up. Uh, ultimately, I would say if you had to narrow it down between the two specialties, plastic surgery probably has a better work-life balance overall. Um, I would say most people would, would probably agree with that statement. It's good to hear. I, I think this is like a really important question for a lot of people because I feel like you've turned on a lot of people to plastic surgery which is, you know, great to hear because we would love more plastic surgery surgeons, especially like microsurgeons in this area. Um, another question, what aspect of reconstructive surgery as a specialty do you wish was different, if anything, or at least, you know, improved if applicable? Of reconstructive surgery, I think um, yeah. a major thing of what we're doing now is in general, I mean, I, we, I, I'm talking about the plastic surgery community, is focusing on patient reported outcomes. And Dr. Pusick over at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston has, uh, has done a lot of extensive research and a lot of publication on patient reported outcomes in, in plastic surgery and trying to, trying to understand what's important for the patient. And let's try to focus our end result on that as opposed to you know, what, you know, what fits societal norms or what we think the patient would like or you know, what we think is you know, an amazing result. Sometimes it's not a good, good result for the patient at all. And so I think opening the world of um, patient reported outcomes has truly changed plastic surgery to some degree. I can give you an example. Before um, patient reported outcomes, a lot of people thought that implant-based breast reconstruction was a gold standard, meaning that if, if, if a woman had a mastectomy um, and you put an implant in place, you know, stretch the skin with a tissue expander and then put a breast implant in, that was like, that was, that's what, that's what all women wanted because it, it, looked better in the first few months or first few years. But over the course of the patient's lifetime, um, 
what we realized is if you had what's called autologous reconstruction or using a free flap like a deep to reconstruct the breast, the scar burden might be a little bit worse and the, the operation is definitely longer and the period to recovery is you know, months or a year as opposed to a few weeks. But over the course of their lifetime, those patients were happier. And that's just a classic example of where uh, patient reported outcomes has completely transformed the field of breast reconstruction after cancer uh, resection. And I think that's an important thing to you know, try to apply to other areas of plastic surgery, which a lot of people are doing now. So speaking of patients, did you ever have, do you usually, when you, you know, take on new clients, take on new patients for um, any surgery, do you take history of previous plastic surgeries into account? And is there a limit to when someone is too old for a cosmetic or just plastic surgery in general? Um, I think if you're talking about reconstructive surgery, then we don't really take age into account. We take medical comorbidities into account. So if someone is like too sick to undergo, you know, a massive 12 hour operation, then, you know, their medical problems might preclude that. For cosmetic surgery, I would say the same thing applies. If a, you know an 80 year old comes in and says she wants a facelift, but she's otherwise healthy, then I think a lot of people would offer her a facelift. Okay. Um, so I don't think age plays that much a role as the underlying other medical problems or, associ- um, or psychological problems. You gotta make sure, especially in the world of cosmetic surgery that the patients don't have you know, body dysmorphia, face dysmorphia, where they're you know, surgeon chopping, hopping, and trying to get as much as possible because there's an underlying psychiatric uh, problem there. I think that's one thing you have to sort of weed out within the cosmetic world, not so much in the reconstructive world, obviously, but I wouldn't say age is as much. I mean, certainly the older you get, the more comorbidities you have. And so a lot of these patients will just get weeded out because of that, but We have a frozen surgeon. Yeah, I think we've lost Dr. Nasser. Give me a sec. Well, all right. So um, in the interest of time, it's uh, already 8.30 Central Time. Ali, I think that we can uh, go ahead and wrap up. Now, are you able to show? Oh, there you are. Um, Amory, you're back. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. We lost you for a moment. Yeah, yeah. We lost you for a second. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, no, you're perfectly fine. You're perfectly fine. It's all good. Um, Let's take, let's take one more. more. Let's, let's do one more Ali. And then we'll let Nasser get on. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask one more question. I think this is one that I'm very interested, interested in for you. What would be your most difficult, what was in your, you know, time as a surgeon, as a plastic surgeon, the most difficult plastic surgery case you've ever taken? Oh man. Um, so I've only been doing it for probably, you know, a year or, a, um, just over a year. Um, I would say anything that sort of head and neck reconstruction sort of akin to the things we did yesterday, uh, is definitely probably the most challenging just because there are so many, uh, moving parts to that. I mean, it's, you're talking about, uh, figuring out the, the oncologic, uh, defect. Um, uh, sometimes it is on the spot. You're then talking about trying to, you know, raise a free flap, inserting the free flap, um, uh, doing bony work, soft tissue work, uh, and then the microvascular work. And so that sort of encompasses a lot of different aspects of, of, of plastic surgery. So head and neck reconstruction is very challenging. It's very rewarding at the same time. They're very long operations. Um, I think in order to do it, you really have to really have to love the field. Um, there, every, every sort of aspect of plastic surgery has its own little uh, quirks and features though. I think hand reconstruction can be very hard. Um, probably the most challenging case I've done in general is um, this was in, in December, a patient came in with an amputation through, um, yeah, that's right. It was, so it was through the second web space. So the patient came in, the amputation was um, from here through the web space like that. And they lost these three digits. And just to give you an example of how challenging this was. Up to 15 years ago, um, hand surgeons used to call this region of the hand no man's no man's land, oh. meaning no one no one no one would want to approach that. And now we're talking about an amputation through one, two, three no man's lands. Um, we ended up uh, putting that hand on the other forearm and connecting connecting it to the vessels here for it to survive. 
And so the patient for two weeks had his normal hand here and a, and a partial hand sticking out his forearm. Um, and then after we proved it survived, after we got all these vessels here ready to accept it again and healthy again, we're able to lift that hand with that, with that radial artery and just connect it as one single anastomosis instead of doing a bunch of random anastomoses. And then that's just the arteries the, and then you have to do the veins and then you gotta do the tendons and you gotta do the bones, you gotta do the soft tissue, you gotta do skin grafts. That's and then so once hard. you're done, that was, that was an 18 hour operation. Um, oh. The patient is just starting because this patient has to do hand therapy for the next year to get any meaningful range of motion and function back. And so you gotta make sure that before you undergo this endeavor, you gotta tell the patient, look, we'll, we'll do this operation for you. It's gonna be you know, massive operations, very long, but you're gonna have to do the majority of the work and that all starts after the operation ends. Um, because you can do a perfect operation, the patient goes home or has a bad hand therapist and isn't working on his hand, guess what? It's gonna, it's gonna look like this for the rest of life. He's not gonna be able to move any of it. It's gonna be totally useless. Um, you're going to have a decent, decent outcome from a surgery, but an amazing hand therapist, and you're going to get an amazing result. Um, that's just another, you know, uh, uh, uh just an, another opportunity to really, really, um, uh, try to instill the, the, the notion into everyone here that medicine is, is a, is a very collaborative field. Um, you can do the perfect operation, but if you don't have a good like medical oncologist or radiation oncologist, the, person's, the patient's going to die. You do the perfect hand operation. If you don't have a good hand therapist, the patient's never going to ha get hand function back. So I think that notion of like, we're all in our own little silos within medicine is a notion of, of the past. And it truly is a very collaborative field where it brings everyone together, I think, and, uh, for, the, for the best outcome possible for the patient. Amar, that's just amazing. That and, is you know, incredible. I, 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 um, I look back over uh, a long career in emergency medicine and that, that patient in my early years would have gotten that hook for a hand and that's all they would have had. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like a pirate. Oh yeah. Like a pirate. And, uh, they, um, and, and they would have probably adapted and gotten along, but they wouldn't have had anything like what you're talking about. So this is just a marvelous, marvelous discussion of how medicine has advanced so far and how you at one of the great institutions in the world uh, are right in the middle of this. So we are so just amazingly grateful for your skill and the 300 kids that were listening tonight were on the edge of their seats, uh, Amher. So uh, we really are grateful. Um, uh, Ali, you want to take uh, them to the exam uh, uh, site uh, so yeah. that they can see? Sure. First things first. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Master, for coming. Um, all you guys definitely should follow him on Instagram at the least. I mean, this has been great just seeing all this. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Just give me a second. And Amar, in the meantime, be sure and look at the chat yeah. and all, all the thank yous that are pouring in to say thank you so much for your time. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys all. I'm Honestly, thank you, Dr. Fowler. Thank you, Ali, for everything. It's been an amazing opportunity to be able to speak to everyone again. I mean, I can't thank you guys enough for this opportunity. Um, as, as always, if anyone has, has any questions, please feel free to reach out. I, I left my Instagram handle in there and uh, not just for this, but if you have any questions about general surgery and I try to approach um, uh, my, my, uh, you know, my career with, with trying to mentor people and, and give advice as much as possible. So if anyone has any questions about, especially international medical graduates, trying to make it into the US, trying to get into residency, trying to get into medical school, feel free to write, reach out, please do. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Yeah, thank you so much. So anyway, on the screen, if I'm screen sharing this correctly, there should be a QR code that has a quiz information for, sex, for um, this session. This is gonna be due at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time next Tuesday. And you have two attempts and if you get 70% or better, you'll get a certificate and everything. If you don't, if you can't get this QR code, then it's perfectly fine. Just go on our website at virtualshadowing.com or wait till our email tomorrow. It will have the links, not only to this session and this PowerPoint that you guys saw today, but to the quiz as well. And if you have any questions, go ahead, shoot us an email. We'll try to respond as quickly as we can. And thank you guys so much for coming today. So on behalf of the whole uh, virtual shadowing team, the working group, and our marvelous speaker tonight, Dr. Nasser, thank you so much. 
We want to thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. If you come, we'll be here, so we're looking forward to seeing you. So on behalf of the whole team, we say we wish you a good evening, and we wish you a good night. Thank you.